Hello, friends. I don't want to repeat myself because it's not getting me. <laughs> <laughs> I love the good one. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> so our presenter today is uh, Mr. Ben Lauder. He's a uh, director for the Center for Spirituality and Sustainability at SIUE. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization that operates the Kula Dome. That's the little uh, geodesic dome on campus, looks like the Earth. So you talk about that. Uh, the center's mission is to promote humanity's sacred connection to the Earth and to each other. So it's going to link to what Carol was talking about this, this afternoon. Um, the Kula Dome was uh, designed and built for the SIE campus in 1921 by a famed inventor, Buckminster Fuller. Uh, ben also serves on the boards of directors for Buckminster Fuller's historic dome home in uh, Carbondale, Illinois. Right? Additionally, he acts as the liaison between SIE and Southern Illinois region and the estate of the Buckminster Fuller. So, without so short introduction, please uh, let's welcome Ben here. All right, thank you, Masanda, and uh, thank you to the Rotary Club for having me here to introduce you to an important uh, architectural landmark and an important organization and really an important uh, legacy that uh, the community and the region at large has the unique opportunity to lay claim to. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, uh, how many people have heard the name Buckminster Fuller? Okay, well, good, I'm preaching to the choir here today, that's great. You'd be surprised the number of people who haven't or don't know if they have, uh, you know, don't aren't aware of what his significance would be. Uh, he was a professor beginning uh, in, in 1960 over at the SIU Carbondale uh, campus. And then when the uh, Edwardsville campus was added, uh, he was part of kind of the planning committee for that and became a dual professor at uh, both campuses. Uh, his He has a global recognition and uh, kind of the, higher you go up in thought leaders and uh, on a global level, uh, his, his awareness and importance increases. Uh, he was a literal genius. He was the president of Mensa, which is the organization for geniuses uh, uh, for a large part of his life. Uh, he held 30 patents. He wrote 28 books, but he did all this without really any uh, official kind of academic credentials. Uh, his family was four generations at Harvard and he had the distinction of failing out of Harvard twice. And <laughs> the, it, it just didn't fit for him. I think uh, with a mind like his, uh, he needed to get out in the world and, and do things for himself. But uh, the, the second time he was asked to leave Harvard, it was officially written down that it was for uh, excessive socializing. So he, <laughs> he definitely loved to talk. Uh, he's famous for you know going on for maybe six hours at a lecture uh, without notes, but just off the top of his head. So he's a very unique mind. Um, he's most recognized for uh, patenting uh, the geodesic dome, which is what the building out there on SIU campus is. Uh, the geodesic dome is a uh, architectural structure that creates you know, a dome out of a series of triangles. That's a lattice of triangles that requires no internal support. Um, so it achieves this by building the same way that nature builds. Um, you know, that a natural structure that's at the top of the news cycle right now is the uh, coronavirus. And uh, you know, they talk about like protein spikes and we see that little graphic uh, on the news beside the, the, you know, the talking head of the coronavirus that we've all seen countless times. Uh, that is a geodesic dome. Um, we had the honor of uh, Bucky's family donating his personal library uh, to Southern Illinois University. Um, I actually drove out there, it was in um, Santa Barbara and brought it back in a couple of loads and then went through all 3,500 volumes in it and cataloged it. And there were many, many uh, academic journals uh, from the 1950s about virus shell construction because he wanted to understand the way that nature built in order to reflect that in man-made structures so that they would be efficient and in alignment with natural forces. He was seeking to um, you do the most with the least amount of materials. Uh, he was a very early person in the 1920s looking at our social data and fuel consumption and resource consumption and, 
and saying, if we continue on this trajectory, we're going to be in a very bad spot in the future, that this what way we're doing things is unsustainable. So he was, uh, you know, an early person talking about sustainability. Hence the reason for the building out there at SIU Edwardsville being called the Center for Spirituality and Sustainability. That's a, maybe sounds like an odd combination, uh, but in, uh, the original reason for being for that building was a place of worship out there on SIU campus. Uh, there was a religious council here in Edwardsville that when the campus was being created was concerned that it was too far removed from town for students to be able to attend church. So they, they lobbied to have this uh, religious center added to the uh, original plan of the campus. And uh, HOK Architects, a famous architectural firm, designed all the other buildings on campus and they planned to build the religious center, which is just gonna be a rectilinear building on campus there. Uh, but since it was an add-on, they never raised the money to do it. Bucky heard it through the grapevine over there in Carlinville that there was a need for this. He saw it as an opportunity to get this building built that had been on his drawing table for a long time that he called a geoscope. He thought that if you could use the, the geodesic dome spherical shape and make it translucent and make it a miniature earth, you could tint the oceans blue, leave the, the continents clear, position that miniature earth over a line of longitude so that you could rotate the miniature earth's line of longitude to match the actual one on the planet where it's located so that you, when you stood in the center of it and looked up, you'd be looking at your place in the world. So when you stand in the center of that miniature earth out there uh, on the SIUE campus, you, when you look straight overhead, you're looking at where you're standing on the actual campus. So it's a really unique kind of transcendent experience really to look at your place in the world from the vantage point of the heart of the planet. And since it's clear, if it was a clear night out and the stars were out and your head was in the exact center of the, of the building, of the, the sphere of the planet, and you say, you know, you're looking out through Edwardsville, any stars that you would see in the actual sky would be in zenith over that location. In reality, and the same as if you looked out through, you know, North Africa and Egypt or Cairo, stars that you would see are in Zenith. So, you know, he really want he thought that if people could see the world accurately and they could see their place in the world, and uh, they would begin to recognize that we're kind of all in this together, because he understood that the, the ideas that he had around creating a sustainable future would require a lot of cooperation. And it, it was necessary that, you know, you could see that, hey, we're all in this together, we're on this, you know, single planet, and you'd see the world, your place in the world and the world's place in the, the cosmos, really. Uh, that was his hope for that building, and he called it a, a geoscope. Uh, but, so he offered those plans and got it built as a religious center uh, out there. And, um, you know, Participation in religion, unfortunately, is kind of down across the board, and especially on college campuses. So it's necessary for that organization to broaden its mission uh, a bit and become the center for spirituality and sustainability. And the thinking there is that a good way to honor the creator would be to take care of creation. So regardless of what your specific faith tradition is, um, that you know the, the, uh, the center's mission uh, promoting humanity and sacred connection to the earth and each other is is um, a, a broader, more inclusive mission that's going on out there. Uh, we still have uh, different uh, worship services. Uh, Sunday mornings at 1030, there's one that's called Soul Sunday, where it's more, it's, it's multi-faith, any faith tradition or even a secular tradition comes and shares quotes or prayers or poem or anything that you want and kind of has a, a just to coming together and, and, and sharing inspirational, uh, and, and, you know, quotes, prayers, anything, song lyrics. That's at 1030 every Sunday. Uh, we also hold uh, uh, weddings, memorials. Uh, Muslim students use it every day to pray. Christian organization students use it as meeting space. Um, it's really inclusive in that way. Uh, it's, it can also be rented as a rental space, to, like I say, to hold a wedding or we have meeting space. 
So, you know, we, we just love seeing the building being used, getting people in there, allowing them to have that experience of, of seeing their place in the, in the, in the world. Um, I'll also mention that the, the line of longitude that the building straddles is the 90th meridian. So you, hear, you see a lot of different buildings around Edwardsville, you know, meridian this or meridian that. It's due to the fact that the 90th meridian comes through here. Um, and it specifically goes through the Edwards, SIU Edwards campus and that dome straddles it perfectly. So it's 90th meridian aligns with the actual 90th meridian. Um, and it, the, the synchronicity or meaningful coincidence around the fact that the 90th meridian is where he built that is really uncanny because in the 40s, he patented a map called the, he called it the, the Dymaxian map. And his goal, again, seeing the world accurately, was to unwrap the three-dimensional sphere of the planet without distortion of the continents. It bugged him that classroom maps, you know, Greenland looks like it's the size of North Africa. It's, you know, the Northern hemisphere up by the poles gets stripped to make that rectangular shape. So it just bugged him that the learning environment, children are seeing an inaccurate picture of the world. So his innovation was to break the sphere of the planet up into triangles, unwrap it without distortion. It's called a Dymaxian map. The normal classroom map is a Mercator map, which uses the equator as its central line of reference. Bucky's Dymaxian map used the 90th meridian as its central line of reference. This is in the 40s. The campus didn't exist. He wasn't even a teacher uh, at the SIU system yet. So it's really uh, a special piece of architecture and piece of history that all of these different you know, things had to conspire that he built his, his most famous invention of GD's a dome over the 90th meridian, which was, you know, arguably his most second famous invention, the Dymaxian map. It's a great place to connect all these, sometimes hard to convey concepts. So, um, you know, if you haven't been out there, I certainly encourage you to check it out. Um, if you're curious about what all this looks like and, you know, some of the things that we've done, fullerdome.org uh, is, is, is our website. And it's a good place to get introduced uh, to what, what it looks like and a little bit of the reference to Fuller history. Um, the building was completed in 1971. So last year, 2021, was our 50th anniversary. We had a lot of good programming that got documented by the St. Louis PBS station, NPR, intelligence or local press. So we've got, we've got links and videos to all of that if your curiosity has been, been sparked here today. And I definitely encourage you to come out and visit too and check it out for yourself. Uh, it's open uh, Monday through Friday, uh, 10 to 3. And our center manager, Tobia, will greet you and uh, show you around. And uh, if you have, you know, weddings, special events, um, religious gatherings, prayer circles, uh, Edward Jones actually used it. Thank you. So it, it's available. It's available to you. Uh, do you guys take questions in these situations? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So what were some of the <coughs> patents? You mentioned, I think, 30 patents. Yeah. So were some of these patents make him extremely wealthy? Or... So he, as far as from a wealth standpoint, he was um, uh, kind of famous for talking about the fact that the amount of money he earned, he spent in going around and promoting his ideas and values. Uh, that in like in the late 60s, I think he was getting about $300,000 a year, which is a lot. And uh, he spent about that much constantly traveling around the world, uh, going primarily like universities and, and spreading ideas about this. One um, of his other famous patents is the Dymaxian car. Now that word Dymaxian is, he's kind of famous for making up words because you know, his ideas maybe transcend language, but Dymaxian means, is a combination of dynamic, maximum, and tension. That was something that he, his genius brain thought those were the key elements. Of it. But the Dymaxian car uh, recently, a version of it visited in, uh, out there on campus, and that's on our website too. Um, it was a three wheeled car made in 1933 that got 30 miles to the gallon, and it, it, the, the rear wheel steered like a rudder. So it, could, it was like, you know, the zero turn lawnmowers we got now, where it would just do zero turn, and you could move like into a parking spot parallel parking spot like nothing. It debuted at the Chicago World's Fair in 1933. 
and it was caused a huge stir. You know, 1930s cars looked like horse-drawn carriages without a horse. You know, they were just fenders and a body. This thing looked like a, a zeppelin or a derivative with three wheels. And it was so distracting, someone blew through a stop sign, hit him, it rolled over, and one of the key uh, financial backers investors died in the car. So that pretty much squashed it because it, you know, it, it looked dangerous. I mean, it wasn't, but then when one of the key investors dies in the car, that throws a little cold blanket on that project. But yeah, so he had, you know, his other patents were all around like uh, homes and designed to be efficient and, and, and in alignment with the environment. Um, he had one, again, the Dynaxian house, sat on a mast. It had a, it had a wind rudder at the top and it would pivot and turn into the prevailing wind. So thermodynamics would heat and cool it naturally. He, he, he uh, took the post-war industrial system that was building bombers out of like stainless steel and to build these mass producing houses. Um, that would be why he did it. He, the reason why is, in, you know, we're not driving around in three wheeled cars and living in domes and, you know, all these, these houses is um, he, uh, he kind of looked at what ought to be and then would create that to hope that people would go towards it. Where, you know, like a, an effective business model would be you do a focus group, find out what people want, and then just provide that to them. Um, he was had a he had an inverted model where he was giving people what they ought to want, and that I mean that's a tough that's a tough sell. But uh, you know it's it's an important an important legacy, and there's uh, you know with, with each passing news cycle, it's, it seems like it's more relevant. Um, and, uh, we got a, the region has a big claim to it. So. All right, well, thank you guys very much. Did I hit my hit my time limit? Did I did. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you.